Okay. Well, when I first prepared this study, I, uh, I focused on Jesus' power. And in this the remainder of chapter 8, there, there are four stories where he reflects his power. His power over the elements and the storm at sea, the wind and the waves crashing around him. His power over the demons when he casts out the demons from the demoniac. His power over disease, the woman who was, uh, had that 12-year bleed. And his power over death, he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. But one thing Jesus did not assert his authority over his people. And we'll see that in the story of the, the Gerasenes actually rejecting Jesus. But the more I looked at the study, I think I would rather have called this faith versus fear. I think that's the other big theme that comes through what we're going to be looking at this morning. Now, I remember the secretary of the School of Accounting at RMIT said to me, never trust the man who says, trust me. Okay. Uh, slightly cynical, but probably from hard experience, that was her conclusion. Never trust the man who says, trust me. Because a man, fallen creatures that we all are, uh, are not very trustworthy. But when Jesus says, trust me, you can, we can trust him. Because God is not a man that he should lie. When Jesus says, trust me, you can be confident that he will do what he says. And that's the theme we're going to see again and again in the rest of Luke chapter 8. So it starts off with the storm. Life's unexpected storms, I call this. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they got into the boat and started out. And as they sailed across, Jesus settled down for a nap. Now, Jesus was a man, he got tired. He wasn't some super spirit, not quite man. Jesus fell asleep. But soon a fierce storm came down on this lake. The boat was filling with water and they were in real danger. Now these were experienced fishermen that experienced storms before, but they were now packing death. Uh, this is a, a very severe storm. And we all face storms now and again. Have you ever lost your job? And you don't know what's next. That's a tough time. Have you ever suffered a broken relationship where someone's walked away from you? That's a tough time. The landlord says, sorry, you've got three weeks to move out. <laughs> That's a tough time. Life has its storms. And the typical response would be panic. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. That was their evaluation of the situation. In fact, in Luke it says... Don't you care that we're going to drown? And sometimes when, when we're in those storms, you think, well, God, don't you care? How can you let this happen to me? Well, when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and the raging waves. Now, would that have occurred to you? Anyone ever been in a situation where you're in a boat and it's rocking badly? Anyone ever been there? Okay. Did it occur to you to say, Okay, that's enough. Stop. Peace, be still. Did it occur to you? Ben, shame on you. Okay. Well, no one would think of doing that. No one in their right minds anyway. Suddenly the storm stopped and all was calm. See, I might try it, but the wind and the, and the waves won't obey me. Okay. The storm continues and the disciples are saying, hey, Jesus, you're a phony. Okay. But he says it and it stops. 
And he says to them, where is your faith? You think about, why did he say that? Do you really think I said, let's go sail to the other side of the lake so that I could drown you in the middle of the lake? Did you really think that I would let that happen? Hmm? I'd never do that to you. And sometimes when you're in those situations, God calls you to move to Bandura and it's a real situation, I won't mention any names. And you think, oh, the finances, oh, the logistics, yeah, we're gonna... and you worry. Okay? Um, and the Lord says, trust me. I was in the boat. You were never going to drown. Well, the disciples were terrified and amazed. Who is this man? They asked each other. When he gives a command, even the wind and the waves obey him. Now, I'm going to break up the sermon. Uh, Alex, do we have that YouTube video ready? Okay. We're going to do a song. It sounds like a kiddie song. Uh Uh-oh. We're going to have volume. Smile at the storm. Come on. Smile at the storm. With Christ in your vessel, you can smile at the storm. As we go sailing home. Sailing, sailing home. Sailing. Come on, come on. Sailing home with Christ in your vessel. You can smile at the storm as we go sailing home. Okay, one more time. Come on, see it like a mean it. Vessel, you can smile at the storm. Smile at the storm. Smile at the storm with Christ in your vessel. You can smile at the storm as we go sailing home. Sailing, sailing home, sailing, sailing home. With Christ in your vessel, you can smile at the storm as we go sailing home. Thank you. Well, I hope that really lodges in your brain. You can't get it out. When I first learned that, you had to then sing it faster and faster and cut words out. You know, and just do the actions. Um, we'll do that at the camp on Saturday night to warm you up. We are all going to face storms, one way or another, one time or another. With Jesus in your vessel, in your heart, you need not be afraid. You'll be able, in the midst of all that turmoil, actually smile and trust and wait and have peace. Now see, their conclusion was, who is this guy? We've never seen anything like this before. There's a second incident where there's a storm at sea. The next storm. It's when Jesus walked on the water, Peter said, that's a ghost. And he said, if it's you, Lord, tell me to come out to you on the water. Jesus says, okay, come. So Peter gets out of the boat which I'm sure is the first time in his entire life he stepped out of the boat onto the water and he walks to Jesus. But then he looks at the wind and the waves, panics and <laughs> down he goes. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, he said. Why do you doubt me? And I've said many times, if I look at Jesus and not the problem, I'm okay. Okay. When I look at the problem or the challenges and take my eyes off Jesus, I sink. Two ways to live. Which do you choose? So Jesus helps him out immediately but kind of rebukes him. When did they climb back into the boat? The wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. No longer, who is this man? It's, you really are the son of God. They exclaimed. Second time, they were reaching a stronger conclusion. Now, people joke about Jesus walking on water in those funny YouTube videos, ha ha. But no one has ever done it except him. Because it defies all the laws of 
nature and gravity. His power over the elements, over the wind, the waves, etc. Jesus demonstrates his authority. Okay, they get to the other side of the lake and uh, they're confronted by a demoniac. So they arrive in the region of Gerasenes. As Jesus was climbing out of the boat, a man who was possessed by demons came out to meet him. Now, came out seems pretty lame. In uh, Matthew, it says, ran towards him, screaming. And we'll see later. The guy was naked, had all kinds of cuts all over him. For a long time, he'd been homeless and naked, living in the tombs outside the town. How do you think the disciples were feeling seeing this madman charge down the hill at them? I know what I'd be thinking. I'd be afraid. Was Jesus afraid? As soon as he saw Jesus, he shrieked and fell in front of him. Now, who's the he? Is it the man himself or the demons within him? Then he screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? We know, we'll see, it was a demoniac, the demons that were speaking, addressing Jesus again as the most high God. They knew who he was. And they were afraid. Now, who's in control here? Please, I beg you, don't torture me. Now, demons are used to having their way. But they were now confronted by Jesus Christ, name above every name, as we sang, and, uh, you know, they were in subjection to him. For Jesus had already commanded the evil spirit to come out of him. This spirit had often taken control of the man. Even when he was placed under guard and put in chains and shackles, he simply broke them and rushed out into the wilderness, completely under the demon's power. And yes, demon-possessed people are known to exercise incredible superhuman strength. One of the signs. The demons were used to having control over this guy. The whole population was afraid of him. And now they'd met Jesus and they were, whoa, begging. Please, don't punish us. Now, how did this guy come to be demon-possessed? Does it happen in Australia much today? Not a lot, but I've had a few confrontations. If you were to go to you know, the Caribbean, you'd see a lot of it with all the voodoo and stuff that's just so prominent in their culture. But it just made me think of one of many Old Testament references. For example, never sacrifice your son or daughter as a burnt offering and do not let your people practice fortune telling. Ooh, if you watch Channel 7, you can see your horoscope. That's now in your face every night of the week. Pardon me. We, turn the t- we change channel. Fortune telling. You think, well, Costa, come on, harmless fun. Or use sorcery or interpret omens or engage in witchcraft. I believe in witchcraft. I believe in spells. It happens. People sell out to Satan, they do a deal, and they think it's kind of cool to be a white witch, not a black witch, and all the ritual that comes with it. You can play around with this stuff or cast spells or function as mediums or psychics. Ever been to a seance? I was when I was a kid. It scared the pants off me and the next day my parents chopped up that table and burnt it in the backyard. So I never doubted the existence of evil spirits. I felt it. Or call forth the spirits of the dead. Now, in today's new age, occult 
obsessed world looking for some kind of spirituality. This is getting more and more popular. And the scriptures say when you do that, you are playing around with evil spirits. You are opening the door. Watch out. Steer clear. Now, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And even before my pastoring days, I had to deal with people who were complaining about you know, being oppressed during the night and you know, pressed down and weird, wonderful dreams and so on. So uh, it's real. And the only solution I can give is the power of positive thinking. Know the name of Jesus that is above every name. And we pray. Because we saw that Jesus had authority over these evil spirits and he has the same authority today and we can exercise that authority. We'll see next week, Jesus sends the guys out to preach, to heal the sick and to cast out demons. He gives them that power. We can have that power today. Now, Jesus demanded, again, I, I emphasise demanded because that says of his authority. He didn't ask. He demanded... What is your name? Legion, he replied, for he was filled with many demons. The demons kept begging Jesus not to send them into the bottomless pit. Now, I imagine that was being vocalised through the man's body. They were begging out loud, bottomless pit? In Matthew's account of this same incident, have you come here to torture us before God's appointed time? Jesus, don't torture us. What's this God's appointed time? In Matthew 25, the parable of the goat and the sheep. 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 Okay. Then the king will turn to those on his left and say, Away with you, you cursed ones. Into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his demons. They know their destiny. And Satan is so malicious that he's going to take as many people as he can with him. I mean, Christians, do you really believe in heaven and hell? Ask yourself that. Is God really going to let honour people's choice? You've rejected me, I reject you. Is he really going to do that? Well, my Bible leaves me no choice but to say yes. And do I really believe that Jesus and the gospel, him dying on the cross for sin, is the only way for someone to be forgiven of their sin, made right with God, given eternal life? My answer is yes to that too. If yes, I believe in hell, yes, Jesus is the only one who can rescue us from hell, then that message that I have, I've got to speak. How can I? If I had the cure to cancer, wouldn't I share it? Of course I would. The demons know that they're beaten, but they're not going to go down without a fight. We don't have to be afraid of them because, again, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world, the devil. He can't touch us anymore. The lions have been chained up. They, can't, they can roar at me, but they can't pour me. So there happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. And so the demons begged him again to let them enter into the pigs. So Jesus gave them permission. When Job was tempted, Satan wanted to have a go at Job. and God set the limits, what you could do and couldn't do. You don't touch his body. Don't kill him. God set the limits. He gave him permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs. And the entire herd plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned. Wow, what a sight that would have been. Now, by the way, pigs, pork... Would Jews have eaten pork? It's an unclean animal. What were they doing with the herd of pigs? It might help explain their response. Let's see what happened. 
When the herdsmen saw it, they fled into the nearby town and the surrounding countryside. Fled, flee, panic, run, ah! Spreading the news as they ran. Oh, might we spread the news as we run through life, the good news. So people rushed out to see what had happened. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus. And here's their response. And they saw the man who had been freed from the demons. They knew who he was. He was sitting at Jesus' feet, fully clothed and perfectly sane. Wow. Their response, they were all afraid. Afraid? I don't say whether the demons were afraid, but why were they afraid? This guy who was a total menace to the community was now cured, healed, and they were afraid? Maybe they thought, well, of course they thought, who is this guy? A holy man now midst? Oh, no. Is he going to get rid of the rest of, rest of our pigs too? Then those who had seen what happened told the others how the demon-possessed man had been healed. And all the people in the region of the Gerasenes begged Jesus to go away and leave them alone. Now, in other towns, oh, Jesus, he healed him. Let me bring my mum. The crowds came to be healed. But their response was the opposite. For a great wave of fear swept over them. Whenever anyone is confronted by an angel in the scriptures, what was their response? Fear. Depart from me, I'm a man of simple lips. Whoa, you know. I know I'm not holy. I know I'm unclean and a holy God, a holy person comes into my presence and, you know, I'm afraid. Here comes a light, the burglar tries to hide from the light. We hide. They were afraid of Jesus. Now, did Jesus, what did he do? He could have said, you stupid people. Let me heal your sick. Let me show you I'm the source of good news. How dare you? Don't you know who I am? So Jesus returned to the boat and left, crossing back to the other side of the lake. I wrote there Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, Jesus says, the door of your heart. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. I offer to come into your life, but you have to open the door. I'm too much of a gentleman to say, ready or not, here I come. I will not impose myself upon you. You have a free will. You can either say, yes, Jesus, or nah, thank you, rack off. And he will honour your choice. He will not impose himself on anybody. If you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. But if you say, I hear you knocking, but you can't come in, he'll leave you alone. You don't want to say that too often or he'll leave you for good. And the consequences will be terrible. The man who'd been free from the demons begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him home saying, no, mate, go back to your family and tell them everything God has done for you. You've been out of circulation for such a long time. No, you know, don't follow me and my routine at the moment. Just go back and tell people what God has done for you. That's exactly what he did. So he went through all the town proclaiming the great things that Jesus had done for him. What a wonderful coincidence. <laughs> what God has done for you, what Jesus has done for you. My conclusion, Luke was saying, Jesus is God. Yeah, 
I'll nail my colours to that one. Jesus is God. Was God in the flesh, rose from the dead, is still God now. And that is a very exclusive and narrow statement. When he said, I am the way and the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father but by me. Either the words of a lunatic an amazing liar or the truth. They're the only choices he gives you. He respects their choice and he walks away. So Jesus goes back to the other side of the lake. It seems to me that he knew there's only one person they crossed the lake for. And that's a demoniac. One changed life that would then phew, repercussions, you know, uh, the billiard ball hits the triangle and they all go flying everywhere, yeah? Other down the track flow on from that. Okay, so he comes back to the other side of the lake. The crowds welcome Jesus. <laughs> Different response. Uh, they've been waiting for him. Then a man named Jairus, a leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come home with him. His only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying. Now, we know that the Jewish authorities did not like Jesus. They were already plotting to kill him. He was not a very popular guy because he didn't fit into their mould. He was going to rock the boat, <laughs> so to speak. Unintended pun. But this man is so desperate, despite his position in the community, he humiliates himself, not humbles himself, humiliates himself by falling at Jesus' feet, pleading, please, come to my home. I need you. Desperation will do that to a person. I had an incident last night, some SMSs with someone who gave me a prank call, but I won't go into that now. I'll show you later. As Jesus went with him, he was surrounded by the crowds. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding and could find no cure. At my previous church, there was a doctor who talked about that. Okay? And uh, I don't remember any of the medical details, but you know, it would have been pretty... Tough situation. She would have been constantly unclean. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe. Immediately the bleeding stopped. Wow. Who touched me? Jesus asked. Everyone denied it. And Peter said, Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. There are lots of people touching you. What's the big deal? Jairus is in a hurry. Imagine how Jairus is feeling. Jesus is coming to my house, he's coming to my house, and he's stopping in this situation. Oh, come on. Now, the woman knew she'd been healed. Jesus said, someone deliberately touched me. For I felt healing power go out from me. Wow. When the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. There was the fear again. Am I in trouble for what I've done? Have I done the wrong thing? I wrote here, healing must be acknowledged. When you experience God's healing power, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You know, I'm meant to believe with my heart and confess with my lips, it says in Romans. Uh, we need to acknowledge it. This woman wasn't going to have a little secret healing. The Lord wanted her to acknowledge it. Let's see. 
She began to tremble, fell to her knees. The whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and it's, she had been immediately healed. And Jesus didn't go, how dare you, why don't you just ask next time? Don't be so presumptuous. He said, daughter, he said to her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. With fear and trembling, and now her faith in Jesus has healed her 12, can you imagine 12 years? I can't. 12 years of suffering and embarrassment, pain, healed because she touched Jesus. He can do the same for you today. Whatever it is, it's your bleed on the inside. And if you know Jesus, I know there are things that are still healing. If you don't know Jesus, I'm sorry, but I know you're bleeding. On the inside, there are issues. We all have issues without God. We're not meant to live without God. And your petrol tank is running on empty. No petrol, the car don't go. Life doesn't work without the God one living within us. Relationship with him is the primary reason I'm here. When I had that, he promises to take care of the rest. Wow. So she exercised faith. Now back to Jairus. While he was still speaking to her, a messenger arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. He told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. It's too late. When Jesus heard what had happened, he said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith, and she will be healed. By this time I thought, that, that's the theme in this second half of Luke 8. Fear versus faith. When you're in that storm, you either worry about it or you exercise faith and bring it to the Lord and trust him for it. There are two choices. And Jesus said, Jairus, don't be afraid. I know they've said it's all over. Trust me. So what happens? When they arrived at the house, I call this situation under control. Jesus wouldn't let anyone go in with him except Peter, John and James. Remember the with him principle? He's now demonstrating to them deeper, more intimate stuff for their future ministry. And the little girl's father and mother. The house was filled with people weeping and wailing, but he said, stop the weeping. She isn't dead. She's only asleep. Now, Or maybe the crowd was there waiting and praying and hoping while she was sick and going down. But they now knew that she was dead. I'm sure they knew dead. And they'd even had time to send the messenger to go tell Jesus, it's okay, too late, never mind. They'd been there a while. They knew the child was dead. And Jesus said, she isn't dead. Oh, come on. But the crowd laughed at him because they all knew she had died. How do you cope when you're laughed at and ridiculed? Oh, we don't like it. And it puts us off our game. Then Jesus took her by the hand and, pray, and said in a loud voice, so everyone can hear it, my child, get up. And at that moment, her life returned and she immediately stood up. Then Jesus told him to give her something to eat. Her parents were overwhelmed, you can imagine, their only daughter. But Jesus insisted that they not tell anyone what had happened. Word was going to get out anyway. But he had this sort of built-in timetable as to how things were to be revealed. Jesus demonstrated his authority over 
death. Only God can do that. And that's the God that we serve today. That's the God who has saved you and lives in your heart now. And he can do anything. You ask him. And when he assures you, don't be afraid, just believe. Trust him. To find an apartment by the 5th of November. <laughs> Trust him. All right. Yeah. We know dead. So in this chapter, what have we seen? It's fear versus faith. The disciples in the storm. He was there to calm the storm. As a demoniac ran towards them, the disciples would have been afraid then, for sure. The demons were afraid of him. The Gerasenes were afraid of him for all kinds of weird reasons. Instead of recognizing he's a wonderful opportunity, let's welcome him. The woman who secretly touched Jesus was afraid to come public and was made to admit what had happened. Jairus was afraid, my daughter is dead, it's all over. Brothers, sisters, I think that's the last slide, isn't it, Alex? Oh, yeah, here we go. Therefore, my beloved brethren, are you currently in the midst of one of life's storms? That you're currently afraid or worried about? I love knowing the answers to things. When do I want to know it? Now. If I, if I have knowledge of the future, who needs faith? Oops. Okay. I don't know. Only one knows the future and promises, as I love to say, I know not what my future holds, but I know who holds my future. I'm in good hands. I am a confident person. I'm not confident in me, confident in God who makes all these wonderful promises to me. And if the promises are there, claim them, trust them, obey them and experience God's goodness. That's a much better way to live than chewing your nails. They're your choices. Oh, I know what I'm going to choose. What about you? Are you caught? If so, are you calling on the Lord to rescue you? God, I'll trust you. The wind and the waves are crashing about me and my previous experience says I am doing something crazy out here on the water, but you know what? You call me out, I'll, I'll keep looking. God wants each of us to exercise faith. Not just the promises of God, Jesus died for, for my sin. He rose from the dead. He lives in me. I have eternal life. That's great. That could be like pie in the sky faith. But I like the faith here and now. Yeah? That's how the Father wants us to live. He's holding my hand, says, Here, son, trust me. That's how he wants each of us to live. I'm trying to encourage each of you in whatever situation that you're concerned about. Talk to God. When it comes to fellowship with one another, what do they say? A blessing shared is doubled. A burden shared is halved. We can also bear one another's burdens, yeah, in sharing supporting, encouraging, praying for one another. That's what makes our fellowship real and strong. Okay, well, let's pray. Father, thank you 
that you've given us example after example after example of the provision of God over the authority that you have over all things and your protection and Lord help us to experience your goodness and your provision as we exercise faith in you. Lord, <laughs> there are real estate agents who say, trust me, and Lord, we can never quite trust them. There are politicians who say, trust me. <laughs> we know we can't trust them. Lord, who else can we trust? You alone, Lord, are worthy of our trust. <laughs> So help us, Father, to come to you in simplicity, in honesty, in humility, even in desperation. But Lord, above all, in faith to then experience your goodness in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his glory's sake. Amen.